What's going on, everybody? Welcome to part two of our Deep Learning with Neural Networks, TensorFlow, and of course, Python tutorial series. At this point, I'm expecting that everyone has TensorFlow installed. If you're on Mac or Linux, your installation of TensorFlow is actually super simple. You just need to go to tensorflow.org, and when you get there, you'll go to get started. Dude, there we go. Uh, and then you'll go down to the pip installation, right? You just run these very simple things and these very simple things and this very simple thing and you're done, okay? If you're on Windows, it's not so simple. So if that's you, if you're on Windows, uh, I have an optional tutorial for installing uh, TensorFlow via Ubuntu via VirtualBox. So if you need that, check that out. I'll put a link to it in the description. Um, that's what I've done. This is a virtual machine. I'm not really running on Ubuntu. I just so happen to want to do this because I have some nice graphics cards or GPUs, I suppose, if you want to call them. Anyway, I've got some nice ones. I wanted to use my main computer. I did not want to pay for a cloud server that would have as much power as this, so I figured I might as well get used to that. Anyway, so it's assuming you have TensorFlow already um, installed. Also, I've got HTOP over here. If you're not familiar, you can just do sudo apt-get install HTOP, and it just gives you a much more better visual representation than top does of like your, these are my, um, my CPUs, this is my memory, my RAM swap if I use it, God forbid, uh, and then the processes and stuff, like if I want to kill a process. Um, I'm going to be writing the code over here in Sublime Text. Use whatever the heck editor you want. I'd be using Idle like I normally do, but I don't have it on here. I don't know how to get it, and I don't really care that much to worry about that right now. And then over here is where I'm just going to run the actual code, and that's that. So uh, TensorFlow does have, I feel like I'd be doing you a disservice if I don't tell you, but for the most part, you write a TensorFlow program, and then you run it, okay? It's part of what makes TensorFlow as efficient as it is, is you set up your code kind of in the background as it's like abstract. And then when it comes time to run it, uh, it runs like pretty much everything kind of in a chunk, not like Python. Like Python is a very kind of slow compared to like really efficient C++ uh, because it's kind of, it's just like line by line nonsense. And so, so what happens in TensorFlow is it's going to take all your stuff and then go in the background and do some things, and then it's going to come back with your answers, okay? Uh, so you're pretty much always going to be writing the whole thing and outputting the end results, okay? Or at least in ch very large chunks you'll be doing this. But TensorFlow does have what's called the interactive session, and that allows you to interactively uh, play around with TensorFlow in your session, which will make a little more sense down the line, but I probably won't talk about it again. But you can do that if you want. Like if you're in, uh, used to doing like interactive shell, like a IPython kind of stuff, then you can by all means still use IPython, just use the interactive session um, for like playing around. But in reality, when you actually would go to actually run this thing, you would not do it in IPython or in the interactive session. So first of all, what the heck is TensorFlow? Like, what is it actually doing for us? So libraries like TensorFlow or Theano and stuff like that, what they are at their inner core is just matrix manipulation libraries, or even better put in like Python terms, array manipulation, or not even Python terms, like C terms, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> list, oh, no. anyway, array manipulation libraries. That's what they do. Like, so you might ask, like, what's a tensor? Okay, a tensor is just your array-like object. So it's just a, an array, okay? It might have a bunch of values. It might be one by eight, eight by one, 5,000 by six million. It could be any kind of size array. It could be a one by one, okay? It can be anything you want. That's a tensor. So all TensorFlow is, is just functions on tensors. So if you can take any kind of problem you have uh, and convert it to this function on a tensor, which is a function on an array, uh, if you can do that, you can do it in TensorFlow. It just so happens that deep learning is pretty much the main area that this sort of thing is being used because that's like the only place that really needs to be able to do, let's say, uh, optimization on, you know, 600 million variables or something <laughs> or in batches. Okay. But anyways, um, the other thing that's kind of cool about TensorFlow is kind of, if you look into it, generally it's, it's, it's called a library for machine learning or for deep learning. Uh, but really TensorFlow, if you really start looking into it, I would say it is actually a deep learning library because 
it has just tons of deep learning functions that you would need pre-built for you that make it a non NumPy like thing. But it, it, at least at its foundation, it's more like NumPy than it is like scikit-learn. It's not at like scikit-learn is so very high level. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, I would say it's pretty close to scikit-learn because it's, it has a lot of helper functions. But anyways, you'll see as we go on. So the first thing um, that we kind of have to talk about is the, the methodology. So Python is just inherently kind of a slow language. C++, for example, is a fast language. Python's slow because it's pretty much read line by line. Uh, so as you start making doing operations, a lot, there's a lot of like sending and receiving and transporting of information that goes on, and, and that's very inefficient, especially if you want to do processing on, say, your GPU or something like that. So what TensorFlow does is first you define your, your model in kind of abstract terms, and this is this is where you're you're building your computation graph, okay? So you define your model in kind of abstract terms, and then when you're ready, you run the session, okay? And that kind of runs the graph, and everything is done in the graph, everything's done in the back end, and everything's like just happening, and then you get your result back, and then you're back kind of in the foreground, and you can start to do things again. So um, let's just kind of go through some of the basics, and I think that'll make a lot more sense, and then when we actually build our neural network, I'll point out at least one thing that will really drive this point home. So anyways, the first thing that we're going to go ahead and do is import. Hopefully you can see that well. I don't know if I can make that much bigger. We'll go with that for now. Uh, I'll move this over. Import uh, TensorFlow as TF. And like I said, the first thing you do is you construct the graph. So we'll have x1 and x2. These will just be variables, okay? We're not even, these aren't even going to be variables. I misspoke. They're going to be constants. <laughs> so they're going to be tf.constant and then a value. We'll say 5. And then x2, same thing. It'll be a tf.constant and a value. We'll say 6. So in this case, in the graph, it's a constant. It won't change. So yeah, it's a five and a six. Okay. But these can also be variables and you can have like these placeholders you'll see a lot and all that kind of stuff. But this is meant to be just a really simple example that I can do really quickly. So there's that. Then you could say the result equals, and you could do something as simple as X one times X two. And I'm not 100% certain that's as efficient as what I'm about to show you. This will work but it's not as efficient as um, the official way of doing this. So anyway, just note that you can get away with that. Apparently I've tried it, but anyway, um, TF dot mole for multiplication X one X two. So you'll notice that these are actually just values. They're not even really arrays. They're just like single scalar values and we're still getting away with that. But in most cases it's going to be some sort of array. So you'll probably have something like this. Whoops. Uh, like that. And then rather than just a simple mole, it's a mat mole. And that's probably the most common mat mole add that you're going to see as we go through. But anyways, uh, we'll just stick with straight up multiplication. Okay, so that's your results. Now, what happens if we print that result? So we'll save this. We'll come over here. I am not where I need to be. Uh, desktop, what do I call this? TF tuts or something? Oh my gosh. What did I call this thing? Oh, capital T. Nice. All right, so Python 3, don't forget the 3, and then tfbasics.py. We'll run that. And we can see the result is just a tensor. At the moment, it's an abstract tensor. It doesn't actually have any value because nothing's actually run. Like in normal Python, if we ran this code, this would be executed, right? Especially if it was the original x1 times x2. And in fact, let me just, we'll kind of go back and forth just because I think it's interesting and I wonder if anybody has the real answer if this is valid, like in the, if this operation is identical to this operation. So if anybody has that answer, I don't, I don't really know. I just know the first time I was playing around with it, I accidentally did that and I was like, hey, it still works. Because at the end of the day, it still creates this abstract tensor. So I don't know. But this is the official way to do it. So that's the way I'm going to mainly do it. <laughs> but I wonder. Okay. So anyway, so you print your result. The result turns out it's just a tensor. It's an abstract tensor in our computation graph. Okay. Now, uh, to actually see the result, you run it in the session. So to get a session, I'm just going to make some space here. This is probably a little big. <laughs> to run the session, you just do... Um, 
there's a few things you could do. A lot of times you might see something like this, like ses, or for sesh, equals tf dot capital S, session, okay? That begins the session, or, or actually, well, sort of begins the session, but gives us mostly our sesh variable. And then what we can do is we can say, we can actually run this session. So we can say ses dot run, and then result, okay? So we save that, whoops. Oh, sorry, that was an error. <laughs> anyway, save that, run that. Okay, and first you get the abstract tensor, which was this result that we printed. And then after that, you actually get the, the 30. And just for my curiosity, I probably should have tested this before, but I just want to know. And I'm just really curious. I'm uh, yeah. Maybe someone that maybe someone has the answer to that one. I don't know. Anyway, seems to be the same results, but I wonder what, if like a speed test would give us the same answers. I think you can get away with that, and I think you can do like a few other things. But anyway, I think you're supposed to use the TF um, methods, but anyway, so that's one option, right? That run, that starts the session and actually runs the graph. So no computation actually took, like happened. Like this just kind of defined a model that would multiply five and six, but no process actually ran to run five and or multiply five and six until we ran the session. Okay. Nothing happened. So, um, so that's that. The other thing, which we kind of didn't do, probably should have done it, but uh, when you're done with the session, you want to do a sesh.close. Luckily, that wasn't very much information. I think we'll be fine, but we'll just run it, okay? And it's just like a file object, right? You, you open it, you need to close it, okay? And really every connection object ever. Um, now, luckily, what you can do is you can, uh, you can do the following. So rather than doing this, this is probably what you should always use. So with tf.session, whoops, don't forget capital S. With tf.session as, angios, as ses, wow, ses, there we go. Now what you could do is print uh, ses.run results. And this is much like, you know, like with open and stuff like that, it will just automatically close when it's done. So you don't have to remember to close the session. Now, a couple things. Um, one thing to note is like, let's say we said, rather than print ses.run result, we could say output equals ses.run results and then print the output instead. Run that, nothing changes. But then what if we, for example, like what if we, um, what if we try to access output? Are we going to be able to access output? Is output part of our computation graph in our session or is that like something else entirely? Something else entirely, right? That's a Python variable, right? So don't try not, you have to kind of like remember that you've got your computation graph, which is like this abstract graph. And then you have the session, which actually like does stuff and can output stuff. And it can also modify tensors within that, that session and then within that graph. Um, and then you can actually save that back to like Python variables again and start uh, referencing them. So you can print the output, but you wouldn't be able to like, like, um, like you wouldn't be able to print ses.run results or you wouldn't be able to run uh, like this. Like you wouldn't be able to do this. Actually you would. Because you still have your no, you'd be outside outside the session. So once you're outside the session, right, you would get that because you attempted to access that closed session. Okay. Anyway, um, just kind of keep those these things in mind, like the separations and stuff like that. But mainly, the big thing to take away here is that you you have like this this computation graph where you kind of model everything. So the number of nodes in our network and the number of layers and the starting values and stuff like that is going to be built into our um, our computation graph and then we when we run the session we'll run that session with an optimizer that will then go through and start managing all those weights and tinkering with them and taking the outputs and stuff like that based on whatever cost function that we built into our ver or our, uh, our uh, computation graph and all of that. That's all going to run and be modifying the weights and such for us to the point where we're not even going to code that. We don't have to code the logic that's going to go through and modify those weights. It's just going to happen. We just have to tell TensorFlow like, this is what we want you to do. We want you to minimize this cost function and stuff like that. But as far as like 
everything else that's involved, TensorFlow pretty much takes over from there, which is, I think, crazy. Um, anyway, if you have questions, comments, whatever, uh, with this code, this hopefully is basic enough. Um, but if you have any questions or whatever, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, in the next tutorial, we're actually going to build a neural network. Uh, we'll probably model it in the next tutorial, and then we'll do the session. Because basically, when you build something in TensorFlow, you, it, it's kind of in two major parts, right? Build the computation graph, build what's supposed to happen in the session, and that's it. Like, it's these two major chunks. So in the next tutorial, we will uh, build the computation graph and kind of model the network. And then probably after that, we'll actually run it and all that. So questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, whatever, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support and subscriptions. And until next time.